Hi, this is Mark from LongIslandWatch.com, and hopefully you're starting the year off right and you got a new mechanical or automatic watch uh, towards the end of last month. Month, So I figured, why not do a video showing you my my five do's for a mechanical wristwatch? And I'll definitely follow up with probably my five don'ts, although I have a lot more don'ts than I do do's. Uh, uh, I'll follow that up at a later period. Um, I'm not really calling this a watch and learn because a lot of it is a, it's, it's fact and opinion. So, you know, kind of just more of an informational video. Uh, my own wrist check I am doing, I'm, I'm actually on a double Islander day, 43 millimeter white dial and 38 millimeter blue dial, kind of like a yin and yang going on. So number one, so my number one do, uh, and even if you're a seasoned collector, maybe some, some of this might be interesting to you. Um, but if you're a, a new one in the hobby, probably all good stuff for you. So my number one is when you set the day and the date for the first time or when the watch is wound down and you don't know if the watch is an AM or PM. So there is a danger zone. The danger zone for mechanical watches is between 9 PM and 3 AM. During this time, you should not quick set the day or the date. There are lots of caveats to this. There are watches that are built against this. Uh, most ETA movements are built against this, as are Rolex movements. Uh, Paddock has a really cool um, way to get around it. But your, most of your low-cost watches with the slow changes, your Miotas, your Seikos, this is a big danger zone. And why is it danger? Well, I've done videos on this, and there are actually watch and learns of why you don't do this. But really quick, between 9 and 3, the day and date mechanism is starting to do its job. Um, and if you go to quick set it, you're going to force it. And there's a little gear, especially in Seiko movements, they're really known for this. There's a little gear inside and it's plastic and you can snap a tooth like that. It's so simple to do. And to change that little gear requires taking the watch apart, taking the hands off, taking the dial off, taking off a bunch of screws and this replacing this one penny. Well, I don't know if it's one penny. It's probably less than a penny to make, but not to buy. Uh, a few dollar plastic part they got to pop back in uh, just to get your day and date rolling again. Uh, so um, here's a little quick uh, example of what I'm talking about. So this Seiko is the perfect example. I, have, I actually did just happen to pick this up, and it's a little bit after 1. I can see the day and the date, I, but yet I don't know if this watch is AM or PM. I have an idea based on the position of the day and date wheels, but I don't want to set the day and the date until I know that I'm out of this danger zone, um, or for sure that I am uh, between the hours of, like, say, 9 a.m. to 3 a.m., which is not the danger zone. Remember, the danger zone generally is 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. So what I'm going to do is I pull the crown out two clicks. I unscrewed it first, and I'm going to change the time clockwise, okay? So 6, 7, 8, 9. So here comes 12. Look at that. So we were at a.m. before, but now... See, the, day, the date flipped, and now the day will flip twice. So now we know that this watch is showing 3 a.m. So let's go another hour or two. So now it shows 6. Today is um, what, Saturday the 9th. So I would now go and set the watch to the 9th and Saturday. And then Saturday. Okay. Now, we go back to setting the time. So let's say right now it actually is, oh, it's 1.15 p.m. So I'm going to go like this. Now now we know this is noon, 1.15. Now, let's say people ask all the time, what if the time is actually between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m.? That's fine. Let's say it was 10 o'clock at night. We just advance it now to 10 p.m. We're not going to change the day and date, so we don't have to worry about um, affecting anything. So that's how you should always change your day and date when the watch is stopped and or you do not know what time it is and that will prevent you from causing damage that normally wouldn't happen. So my second do is, sorry people I know in Great Britain or the UK they get all bent out of shape when I do that. It means two. <laughs> To me, it does. Uh, is cleaning. Uh, cleanliness on a watch, 
And that only makes it look good, but it will definitely last a lot longer and you won't deal with issues like corrosion uh, and things falling apart. Mostly for dive watches, but from any watch in general, um, hopefully it's water resistant, you want to rinse it every now and again with a little bit of warm water and some soap. Uh, whatever kind of soap you want to use. Just something mild. Anything used for your hands is probably fine. Baby shampoo is fine. Um, and you're just cleaning off dirt and grime. Um, toothbrush, very, very important, easy to use, gets in all the little nooks and crannies. Uh, important area that some people definitely neglect. On the back of a diver, I guess I'll take mine off. Divers especially. But really any watch with a screw down back where that's raised a little bit. Okay, you want to scrub between the area, the area between the case back and the case itself because you collect dead skin cells, suntan lotion in the summer, uh, salt, particles, all garbage in that little zone. And if the watch ever needs service and it's not cleaned properly before you remove the back, when you crack the seal, a little line of disgustingness pops out. And that disgustingness is all your body things <laughs> you mix with suntan lotion and body oil um, and if that gets in the movement that's not a good thing at all at all uh, so you want to keep the case back clean but cleanliness the most important time to keep a watch clean especially a dive watch is after using it in salt water going to the beach sand um, what i do when i get back from the beach or you know not like immediately, but you know, within, certainly within a day or so, is I will submerge the, submerge the watch in warm water, and I will, I'll well, do on this one, it's easier for me, work the bezel, counterclockwise, obviously, and just underwater, keep doing it, keep doing it, until, um, it, it'll probably be difficult at first, because there'll be sand lodged in it, uh, and what you're doing is just running the spring out, getting rid of any little um, pieces of sand or anything else that might be stuck, uh, keeping it free and clear. Uh, and then again, you want to rinse it with water and a little bit of soap. You're getting off the salt water. Salt water is horrible for any metal. Just as anybody who does any boats or you live near the water, uh, salt is a very bad corro uh, corrosion element. You know, in military testing, anything went on a boat went through salt fog testing and you can get almost anything to rust. Yes, your watch is stainless steel, but at some point during your watch's birth cycle, when it was being made, it was touched by a tool that was not stainless steel. And that tool leaves iron deposits behind, which in the presence of salt will rust. Now, again, as part of the watch being made, there was a passivation process that takes place that kind of it's like an acid watch that gets rid of any of that um, non-stainless steel material that's left behind. Um, but yeah, there could be a little piece lurking and all you need is for a little rust to start. And then it kind of never stops. So keep your watch clean. Uh, my third one, storage. And maybe you have one watch. So if you have one watch, great. So where do you keep it? Do you just keep it on a dresser at night? Well, I don't agree with this. Now I... I do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. My dresser is loaded with watches. I'm actually in the middle of doing something for mass storage because I have a ton of watches and I filled up seven watch boxes now. But I actually, believe it or not, I have like an old bowl of a box. Um, I own a bowl of a somewhere. But that's, believe it or not, that's where I keep my white gold Daytona. It just stays in here. It doesn't stay on a desk. It doesn't stay on top. Um, and my reasoning is, is that I hear this from so many customers. Um, the watch is on the nightstand and they knock it off and it falls onto a tile floor or a wood floor and guess what it doesn't work anymore guys watches are automatics and mechanicals one two three hundred parts all working in harmony all extremely extremely fragile yes they can take the daily shock of life that you throw at it it could take a fall onto a carpeted floor eh, probably that problem but if you drop it onto a hard floor a ceramic tile floor oh my goodness the g's that are felt inside the watch probably approaching about a thousand G's or so. Um, and something is going to break. Your, the gears are balanced on these really, 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 really thin pivots and they're going to snap. And it's gonna be really expensive to repair. If it's even worth repairing, because if it's something like a, a Seiko or something else, you're probably gonna wind up just replacing the whole movement. Uh, so I definitely recommend some kind of storage. If you only have one watch, just use the box it came in. Right? Um, if you have more than one, then invest in a box. You can get boxes on the dreaded Amazon or any other, you know, 
favorite place that you like, something that holds 5, 10, 20 watches, whatever you want. And that way, they're always in a safe place and away from, away from accidents, away from kids, away from all these bad things that could happen. Um, back on dive watches, number four, my fourth do. After about two years, of uh, a new dive watch, you do want to have it water resistance tested if you are going to use it in and around the water. It's a very simple test. Any real watchmaker can do it because as a fact of them changing batteries and watches and doing other service, they have to water resistance test watches when they're done. So bring it in. It's probably be a nominal fee. They can test it just to three atmospheres, whatever, just to make sure it's still holding a seal. It's an air test, so even if it leaks, it's not going to be a problem. Um, I really don't feel there's a need for you to bring a watch to its full two or 300 meter depth in a wet test because you're almost going to find nobody that can do it. Very few people can do something like that. It's fairly specialized equipment, um, and it's an expensive test to do. Uh, but just a quick air test will tell you everything's fine. Uh, and then if not, then the watchmaker can change a seal, loop something up, do whatever they got to do to make sure the watch is still water resistant. Um, my Submariner is approaching now about seven or eight years since the last time it was ever touched by anybody, uh, serviced. So I won't bring it near water simply because I really don't want to risk it. Um, a Seiko or something else that may be three or four years old, I'm not that concerned because if it breaks, whatever, I'll, <laughs> I'll get another one. But, you know, with your more expensive watches, um, and maybe if it's your prize Seiko, you don't want to do that. Don't take a chance. Um, get it tested. You know, like I said, like after like the first two years or so, you want to test these things. My fifth one, okay, and this is probably, this is, I think, the most important one. The other four can lead to catastrophe and things breaking. But this one, I think so many people ignore. It's actually, it's like two wrapped in one. Buy what you want and wear what you buy. What do I mean? Well, if you don't figure out, if you can't figure out what I mean, buy what you want. I see so many people that post on forums, Reddit, wherever it might be, and say, how does this look on me? Or what do you think of this watch with this outfit? Or, Who the hell cares? Buy what you want to buy. And whatever you do, wear it. Don't lock it away. Um, it's a watch. It's meant to be worn. It's meant to be seen. It's going to get scratched. It's not going to look new forever. Um, even if it's a special piece, break it out every week or two weeks. Or I just don't understand people that buy watches and throw them in safes and leave them there. And that'll probably lead to my five don'ts of watches also. Um, or maybe ten don'ts. Who knows how many don'ts I will have. But my, I really feel that it's a hobby that you're supposed to enjoy. So again, you buy what you like. If you want to wear a brown strap with black shoes, go right ahead. If you want to put a diver on leather, it looks great. I think it looks great. Go right ahead. Um, if you're an Invicta fan, enjoy them. They're all watches. They all tell time. And the ugly truth is your phone tells time too, so you really don't even need a watch. So um, I think that's it. Those are my five do's. So this has been Mark uh, from LongIWatch.com. I'm curious give me some of your do's and you know i'll comment where i can if something's important i'll try to pin it um but those are the top five that kind of popped into my head like i said the first four can lead to catastrophe fifth one i feel is just why would you buy a watch if you're not going to wear it uh please like the video if you enjoyed it. subscribe to the channel uh if you have not done so follow me on instagram so go ahead this little counter go up and get me up to a seven digit counter soon uh and i already told you to leave the comments down below and see you in the next one thank you very much Bye bye